Um, nice to you all, and thank you so much for inviting us today. So I'm Adelaide from Youth for Climate Belgium. I'm also here with Jada from Youth for Climate Belgium. And um, first to explain a bit what is uh, Youth for Climate uh, and what our goals are. Um, Youth for Climate is basically a movement that puts pressure uh, on governments and political uh, leaders. And to do so, uh, we take different kind of uh, actions. Uh, we march, for example, we have um, striked for 20 Thursdays in a row from January 2019 to May 2019. So during those uh, 20 Thursdays, with, we decided to not go to school and actually take the train to the streets of Brussels. Um, and first we were 3,000, then we were 12,000, and then 35,000, and and we were just thousands in the streets of Brussels. And then we also figured out that it wasn't only in Belgium that this was happening, but also in many of the countries, first in Europe, and then it spread all over the world. So it's now a global movement, um, and Youth for Climates is uh, kind of um, the Belgian movement of the youth movement. Uh, we have done also other actions like occupation. Uh, we have occupied the federal, uh, the federal parliament in Belgium to put during three days to put pressure on uh, the climate law that was supposed to pass, but uh, did not pass. But the pressure was there, um, and then we put pressure also on the European Parliament. Uh, so we occupied the European Parliament also for um, a few days with FFF Europe. Um, and then we also went to festivals. In, uh, last summer, we went in festivals just on trying to get in the big, biggest stage to bring this dance for climate idea to again bring uh, this idea of, of uh, bringing climate everywhere. This topic that cannot be forgotten and should be talked about everywhere, whether it's in uh, parliaments, uh, festivals, the streets in between friends. And during this whole process of organizing different actions, uh, we really created coalitions in between experts. We worked with more than 100 experts uh, on 27 recommendations that could be directly implemented in the Belgian law. So this is now uh, a thing that can, uh, it is now a document that can be directly implemented and we have given it to each a leader of the different political parties in Belgium. Uh, we have also created coalitions in between the youth movements from our uh, from uh, the EU side, also on a world international uh, side. With technology today, it's really easy to be connected with youth from all over the world. And uh, we also created coalitions with associations in Belgium. We work together with associations that have sometimes the same goals as us. Um, and most importantly, I think is also creating coalitions in the indigenous people from the Amazon forest, because we had the chance to send three people inside the Amazon forest uh, last from October 2019 to December 2020. And that's where this strong coalition started. And now we are really working uh, with them. The goals of Youth for Climate is mainly to spread awareness about climate change and uh, put pressure again on a federal and European level, whether it's putting pressure for a climate law to pass or now today really putting pressure for this green deal that is put forward um, for it to not be uh, like, for it to be a real change, a real way uh, to achieve the targets that we have. And then I'll let um, Jada talk about the rest. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Jada, also from Youth for Climate. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit how the COVID-19 crisis has affected uh, young people and activists. Um, first of all, you need to know that behind every activist is a normal young person um, that experiences real life situations like school. Uh, right now, we uh, a lot of us have exams, but we manage to stay active um, during these difficult times. Um, but it was also important to give Corona um, the time needed 
um, because it is a health crisis and every crisis should be treated as one. Um, so we did also movement, movement building with our own org organization, um, Youth for Climate Belgium, but also on the international aspect as uh, Fridays for Future, um, such as we um, organized a meeting to put pressure on Franz Timmermans for, the, for a change in European agriculture through an online meeting. Um, we also had our weekly webinars um, to stay in touch with experts um, and also for um, people to um, spread awareness as that is our main goal also from Youth for Climate. We also had our digital strikes um, through Zoom with our um, hashtag climate strike online. And um, we had also our solidarity actions um, for the nurses in front of the hospital. And we also supported um, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, because climate justice, there is no climate justice without social justice. So, yes, I will give the floor back to Adelaide. So now speaking uh, a bit about how this Corona crisis kind of hit a bit different movements or uh, like we are really in contact with a lot of people now all around the world. Um, so we could see a bit how people re would react differently maybe to this crisis that hit much the whole world. Um, what we have noticed is that Yes, uh, it was a change for everyone. We had to adapt, but it was not the same adaptation for everybody. It means that even in Europe, depending on our private uh, situations, it would really depend if the adaptation of staying home would be easy or not. Uh, but on an international level, it was really clear that it was not at all the same adaptation we are in contact, I told you, with people from uh, the Amazon forest, indigenous people, indigenous communities, and hearing their messages, hearing uh, from them was really, really hard for us because not only are they facing the fact that we are taking their lands, we are destroying uh, their environments, uh, we are destroying pretty much everything they have. They are not even seen uh, from their government as uh, human beings, um, their human rights are not respected at all. And that's just on a general basis. But adding to that, uh, they have been hit by the Corona crisis. And so it's, of course, an addition to everything that they are already going through. And so that is, that is really hard to see that they have to face a virus while they were already facing disease, already facing the fact that they had to fight for their lands. Um, and worse than that, the government, the Brazilian government, uh, is uh, was, is actually using this momentum of Corona to be able to cut more of the Amazon forest. So the environmental minister itself in Brazil said, you know, this is the moment to uh, release a bit our climate, uh, our lows on cutting. Uh, On protected, on protected areas in the Amazon forest because the media are not watching, because the media are focusing only on Corona. And so this really shows that if we do not put media pressure, if we don't put any pressure on the Brazilian government, on, on the way we treat the Amazon forest, um, it will just go wrong because the people living inside the Amazon forest um, are just not respected, the rights are not respected, and Corona did not help them out. They are facing the virus, but they are also facing a government in Brazil that are not helping them with that virus, but also not helping them with their basic situation, basic needs. Um, no, they are, uh, their, their lands are being grabbed. Um, so this was, of course, really hard to hear for us. And it's at that moment that we realized the adaptation of this crisis is not the same uh, if you live in Europe or somewhere else, or depending on your situation, personal situation. So it's important, I think, for us Europeans to also remind us, be reminded of this situation in Brazil and in the Amazon forest, because we have an impact on this. The decisions that are being taken here in Europe 
have an impact on what's happening in the Amazon forest today. And so we have a part of responsibility of responsibility here, and we have to make sure we do everything in our power for to not emphasize uh, what's going on in the Amazon forest um, and to be able to protect indigenous communities. Okay, many thanks. And uh, as I was informed, there was a technical issue. So I will uh, say again for people who could not uh, understand it, this is a welcome to the 10th edition of the Green Post Talks of the Green European Foundation. We are talking today about the impact of the crisis on young people. And we already had an introduction from uh, two representatives of Youth for Climate Belgium. And I now am happy to give the floor to Michel Piccinino, who is a board member of the European Youth Forum. Michel, maybe first you can introduce us to your organization, what are its activities, its goal, and then elaborate on how your organization, your members experience the crisis. So. Hi, sorry, I started speaking while still muted. So, first of all, thank you for the invitation and having me uh, at this event. The European Youth Forum is a forum which represents young people and youth organizations all over Europe. We have over 100 youth organizations, which are divided between national youth councils of countries of all over Europe, not just the EU, but uh, all over Europe, and international youth NGOs, which also work within Europe and beyond. Our activities, uh, we represent young people with the European institutions, so we work a lot with the EU, the Council of Europe, and also the UN on European levels. And we try and, of course, then push forward youth issues when it comes to youth rights, participation, and also, but also sustainability and other stuff. Uh, and of course, we had the, work, the COVID situation had a lot of impact on us, our membership, and young people in general. More than, of course, COVID, I think, had a threefold effect. Of course, there was, first of all, the health situation, which people had to deal with. And then if there was also the financial situation, which I think everyone is aware of. But there was also a governance situation where some, in some countries, democracy was also put in quarantine, not just people because of coronavirus. And here I will speak about a bit more on what we will have been doing, also our proposals, etc. For now, that we're going hopefully out out of the health crisis. Let's put it this way of Corona. So, of course, already in March, we, were, we started discussing the whole COVID situation internally within the board, and we discussed and we decided to have a blueprint of what should be the proposals for a post-coronavirus world. Of course, in the beginning of April, also there was. Already, we were already discussing and we issued a statement on the situations in some countries, for example, in Hungary, where there was, uh, we felt that the bill on the protection against coronavirus, in fact, had direct consequence, for example, on human rights and the rule of law for young people within Hungary and in other countries, where such a law uh, gave unlimited power to the prime minister to, by decree and threaten journalists, for example, with five years imprisonment if they had uh, reported anything which was deemed to be fake news. So, and we hope, of course, that now that countries are ending the health crisis, at least in their opinion, uh, there would also be the restoration now of everything, all the freedoms which were guaranteed before the pandemic started about. Our first reaction when it came to the pandemic as a, as a whole came on uh, in April, in the 20th of April, when we, there was a reaction to the European Parliament's uh, coronavirus resolution where the resolution discussed a lot of things on the idea of the parliament on what should happen, what should be the way forward in Europe post-corona. And in our reaction, we said that basically that we hope that there was, that we agreed that there was a need of a recovery plan, that however, we stress that the importance that uh, such proposal does not cut short the MFF proposals, the multi-annual financial framework proposals for essential sectoral programs. So for example, that, uh, Erasmus Plus would not be affected negatively because of such recovery plan. Unfortunately, 
in certain areas, such as Erasmus, uh, the pandemic maybe was also used as an excuse to not to cut funding from the original proposal, and therefore maybe young people are being also affected negatively in that aspect. So uh, of course, it was we asserted that a recovery of the crisis was an opportunity for systematic change. Uh, in the case of the our economy, where the importance was to place equality and sustainability over profit and exploitation. The current economic system makes too much importance to profit and exploitation. So, and that exploits uh, the, both the humans and the world, and there is the importance to be, have more equality and sustainability. Uh, so, the ILO calculated that young people will be disproportionately affected by the crisis, and especially in the labor market. And in fact, Commissioner Schmidt himself uh, said, and here I quote that about young people, this is this may be, they may be less affected by the coronavirus itself, but our youth are the most at risk from social economic consequences. And that we know that unfortunately, there, when there is a decree in, labor, in, the, in the labor demand, young people are normally the first to be laid off. So young people are disproportionately affected economically and the most hard hit when it comes to economic in economic measures. And unfortunately, we do know that uh, some countries still have discriminatory measures which prevent young people, for example, from accessing social protection measures, uh, unemployment, unemployment benefits, and minimum income. So these are stuff which for sure definitely affected young people much worse during the pandemic. And this need, we said that this needs to change to avoid another generation which has been left behind specifically because of the coronavirus situation. Uh, on the topic of intergenerational work, on the occasion of the EU Day of Solidarity Between Generations, we also issued a joint statement with AGE, which is the platform Europe, which is the voice of older persons within the EU, on EU level. And we emphasize the need for intergenerational cooperation to build a post-pandemic world, which is designed for everyone and the planet. So, focusing on the humans and the planet at the center of any type of recovery moving forward. And we focused on like five points that we cannot delay reflection process and now the commission on demographics changes and aging. This cannot be delayed anymore. Implementing all provisions of the European pillar for social rights. So COVID proved how crucial it is to safeguard and strengthen social Europe, which is based on solidarity. The importance of building synergies between the European, uh, the EU economic post post COVID nineteen recovery plan and the European Green Deal. Of course, it is important that such a recovery does not go against our environmental targets. We have one planet, and we need to make sure that it's safeguarded. Of course, the adoption of an ambitious EU budget 2021-27, which needs to make sure that there is a comprehensive support for our economic pro social protection system and collective effort again to tackle climate change and leading a global discussion on how to mobilize all generations to save both humankind from the pandemic and our planet from climate change because they are both uh, impacted negatively with what's going on around us and the importance that everyone on earth has, has an impact on this and works together to make sure that we tackle fundamentally how societies are organized and indirect. Now, today, we also issued a blueprint on how we feel that post-COVID-19 world needs to be. And we had three sections in this blueprint, which was, first of all, social and economic inclusion. The second was human rights, civic space, and participation. And the third being beyond recovery, sustainable alternatives to build back better. So basically on how to build better than it was on a sustainable way. And in this blueprint, which is like 15 pages long, so I will not go into detail, but I will give some examples from it. Uh, we focused on, on these three areas, but also in every single area of them, we gave three different types of responses. So emergency response, now what we need to be now because of people are facing an emergency, a medium-term recovery, but also third, fundamentally the long-term change. We need to change. We cannot just go back to what was normal in February. It wasn't working. So basically, first of all, let's respond in an emergency situation now. Secondly, let's 
recover, but what we need to recover and people still need to make sure that they have food on the table, et cetera. But thirdly, let's make sure that there is a long-term change, both when it comes to social and economic inclusion. So for example, when, to give just an example, of course, now on social and economic inclusion, we need to make sure that there is short-term measures, economic support, uh, deferment on mortgages, et cetera. On medium term, it would be to heal, had the lessons from 2008, make sure not to commit the same mistakes, do not relax the labor legislation like we did in 2008 to stimulate high employment. We need to make sure to focus on quality jobs and social rights at the center of everything we do. And of course, when it comes to long-term change, we need to tackle precarious employment, ensure social protection for everyone, irrelevant of their age and no discrimination whatsoever. Some examples also when it comes to human rights and participation. In the case of an emergency response, so what to do now? Make sure that young people and youth organizations are involved in designing emergency response. So nothing without nothing about us without us. There is it is not possible to have stuff to combat challenges for young people without young people actually being at the table. Uh, once I heard the example, if you're having dinner, if you're not around the table, you're on the menu. So we need to make sure that young people are actually around the table shaping their emergency response themselves. Uh, when it comes to, for example, medium response, when it comes to human rights, make sure that the recovery has to be built on a rights-based approach, focusing on having everyone access their fundamental human rights. And as a long-term change, we need to focus on making sure to mainstream youth issues. So we need to make sure that uh, the perspective of young people is taken into account in everything. So if it's health, education, housing, employment, not just the youth issues, which people also always associate with youth. And we need to tackle barriers for young people to make sure that they are possibly accessing such rights. And fundamentally also sustainable alternatives to building back better. So the third section where we need to make sure that to first of all, put the most vulnerable and affected first. We need to help them first because they're the most at risk. As a medium term recovery, we need to commit to sustainable development, making sure that EU and national resources are not used to fund economic activity, not in line with the SDGs or the Paris Agreement or the do not harm principle, which is enshrined within the European Green Deal. And also when, for example, it comes to the long-term change on sustainability, we need to make sure to invest in new economy by supporting businesses that put sustainability at, the, at their core. So make sure that sustainability is a condition for actual stimulus and help and adopting uh, alternative measures of progress. So how we measure progress at the moment, we only measure progress based on the GDP, which only uh, calculates economic measures. And we need to change that and make sure to also start measuring uh, real well-being of humans and the planet, as that is the real progress which we can uh, calculate and not just the money. Okay. Yeah. Could you uh, wrap up your first contribution? Sure. You know, so that basically in a very uh, short introduction, our also blueprint for the economic recovery to make sure that no young person is left behind when it comes to the recovery, uh, the COVID recovery. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, now it's time to uh, move to our last uh, speaker for the SG Gaga. As I said, she's Secretary General of the Federation of Young European Greens. And also for Utke, the, the question, uh, how do you assess the impact of the crisis so far? And also what in the future, what kind of impact the crisis will have on young people? And also, how do you see until now the political response? Uh, we know there's a European recovery package, which has its nice name, Next Generation EU, but does it make direct reference to young people? So, Özge, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. I hope you're all hearing me because I was also having some technical issues. If I don't see any confused faces, I assume you're everyone is hearing me. Great. So, uh, yeah, uh, in this time that is allocated to me, I will try to bring the green perspective to the Corona crisis because I think it's very interesting uh, to look how the COVID-19 started and then how it ended up in this full-blown corona crisis that we're seeing right now. Because very simply, when we look at the start of the COVID-19, it was this COVID-19 virus is uh, a result of the, uh, the fundamentally broken relation between humans and nature. 
But if you look at the Corona crisis right now, it is the years of destructive globalization, exploitation, and the neoliberal economy, together with the COVID-19 virus, that ended up us in this today's full-blown crisis. Uh, I assume many people are aware of David Greber's bullshit jobs theory. Uh, we never had the grounds to test this theory until the corona crisis hit and we all went into lockdown. Uh, but um, but it, this was an interesting test for, of us, for all of us because what we saw uh, when we went into the lockdowns is that, no offense, but a business consultant, let's say, who would be valuable in normal times is completely useless in the face of a global pandemic. Uh, instead, we relied on the work of caregivers, nurses, supermarket employees, um, teachers, uh, at least we started appreciating the word of, work of teachers, caretakers, etc. So these jobs that are undervalued are the most, were the most valuable work jobs during the crisis. And if you look at the statistics of these job lines, these people are poor, they are women, they are black and people of color, they're migrants, they're underpaid, they are overworked and they have no security because these, these jobs are not valuable in economic terms as they are valuable to us, to our society. So I think in this pandemic, we asked, a lot of people asked, what is the value of my life? And the answer given to us by most of the time was nothing. Uh, we saw this at times very literally when a black person was killed on the street by a white police officer, merely on the base of the color of his skin. Or more figuratively, when a lot of people were asked to go to work to save the economy. So um, I don't want to undermine the Black Lives Matter protests right now happening in the US or the police violence, but I think there is a good uh, correlation between why the protests are happening right now in its form, uh, because this is not the first time a white police officer killed a black man. This is not the first time that it was filmed. This is not even the first time that a black man said, I can breathe on video while he was murdered by a white police officer. Because it's now we see that it black people have been denied a good life. And I will quote my uh, rapper here. And yes, we are going there because uh, one of my favorite rappers, Killer Mike, says that uh, poor white people have been denied, women have been denied, gays and lesbians, transgender people have been denied, immigrant children have been denied. Everybody outside of that 1% has been denied. And young people too have been denied. Young people were hardest hit in the 2008 financial crisis. This crisis in 2008 has not only led to a very high youth unemployment rate, especially in Southern and Eastern Europe, but also a stance among political decision makers that any job is better than none. That left us with unpaid internships, gig work, zero hour contracts, and the current generation of young people, we are worse than our predecessors. And right now, when we are living this, well, we are reliving this corona crisis, uh, we are facing the biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression. If you look at the statistics, uh, we see that uh, I only have the American and the UK statistics with me, but 7.7 uh, .7 million younger than 30 in America is now unemployed, and in the UK, one million younger than 25 is unemployed. And why the youth is hardest hit, because yes, uh, Michael was also referring to this, uh, because they are the first ones to let go in a crisis. Uh, they, they seem to be easier to lay off uh, in, uh, in these times. But also, we already did not have stable jobs. We were already working in retails. We were already re working in bars and restaurants. And these sectors were the hardest hit. Uh, in Corona crisis. So now let's, if you focus on Europe and what Europe is going to do about it. So the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, announced the next generation EU plan. And this week we will see how the council will, will react to it. Uh, in Federation of Young European Greens, we uh, uh, welcomed it with, a, with criticism, of course. 
But I want to quote something that Ursula von der Leyen herself said, and I'm quoting it word by word. She said, this recovery pack is a lot of money. The next generation will have to pay back. So us, basically, the next generation EU is asked to take out a huge loan, and we are not even given a chance to speak what the money should be spent on. So I don't want to go to the metaphor of if you're not around the table, you're on the menu, Michael said it, but, uh, but this is more or less that. So if we are taking out this loan, then we should have a say on where this money is going to be spent on. For, for the young people, I can say, firstly, we are not paying for this recovery. Rich people should pay for this recovery. We already don't have jobs. We already don't have any security. We don't have homes. Have you, like, we saw a lot of rent strikes happening across Europe. And how come we are still asked for the, to pay for this recovery pack? Rich people should pay for this. Billionaires should pay for this. So the uh, European Union should start with taxing digital giants and stopping tax evasions. So this is the first response to, from us. And secondly, we will not allow any more neoliberal economy policies and austerity measures. We are not going to work more hours to stimulate the economy. We don't want any job is better than none. We want a good life. We want to work four days, work weeks, and we want a universal basic income. And finally, this, what we are seeing right now is just a trailer, what is to come with the climate crisis. I think this crisis showed us once again, um, how willing the political decision makers are to postpone taking action in the face of a crisis to save the market and how easily they trade a good life for profit. So this also gives us a glimpse of what their action or inaction will be and what it already is in, uh, when it comes to fighting climate crisis. So this recovery plan is said to be green, but if you look at the details, the national recovery plans are not monitored, they are not climate proof, the rules to judge a plan is green or not are very general and very vague, and the state aid is completely unmonitored. For a truly prosperous next generation EU, we have to make sure that not a single euro cent is spent on fossil fuels. So what do we do? Like when I'm ending, I want to end with this a more hopeful note. And it's, I don't know who is following the British politics, but uh, a 22-year-old football player uh, actually wrote an open letter and he convinced the UK government to continue giving uh, food or uh, continue the school lunch programs in summer, because this was also one of the things that we as young people faced when Corona crisis hit and the schools were closed. Uh, a lot of students who were staying at the dorms in universities and getting uh, the university um, dinner lunch packages were no longer able to afford it. And this is in one of the richest countries of the world, children are facing poverty. And a 22 year old football player has a better vision of how to run a country than the prime minister of the country because he understands what this is and he can feel empathy. So, um, so young people should run for the positions and be active in politics so that we can make actually next generation EU proof plans for our future. So uh, this is the long term solution for this crisis. Thank you. Okay, okay. Many thanks also for your considerations on the European Green Deal and on the recovery package. Maybe this can also be a question for the members of Youth for Climate Belgium, Adelaide and Yada. How do you uh, perceive the plans at the European Union? We already had the Green Deal. We have the recovery package. Do you think they are, they are strong enough to really uh, have the translation of the climate policy we need? Um, I think before the climate crisis, uh, sorry, the Corona crisis arrived, we were actually um, beginning of March in front of the council with 50 youth from different, uh, from 27 EU countries demand for the climate law to have a stronger ambition um, because well, negotiating for 2050 targets still today is 
too slow. Negotiating between a 40 to 55% reduction is way too little. So that was our that was our call. Um, and then, of course, the corona crisis arrived. So we give the space to corona that it needed because we need to treat each, each crisis as a crisis. So, um, but now the question really is, there is a first step that the European level did. Um, there is this Green Deal. It's, uh, it is still not perfect, but it's a first step towards the right direction, towards the uh, zero carbon society. Now the question is, are we going to use this tool to do the transition now? to use the turn we are in today. Our society, we, uh, we have slowed down, sorry, we have slowed down our economy, we have slowed down everything, so we are really a turn in society. If we don't use that turn right now, we will probably never reach our uh, goals, our climate goals, never reach the Paris Agreement. And so the question now is, today, during the recovery plan, is it really going to be, uh, used are we going to use the green deal are we going to take the transition now are we going to put the budget uh that we need to be uh we revalue the the jobs that really need value that we don't give uh, a huge amount of budget to companies that we will have to close anyways in a few years if we want to be able to do the transition but do we put the money in the transition so if, if we give a big amount of budget to a company that we say that first there are clear conditions and that those conditions make sure that the company itself goes through a transition um, and that the money goes for the workers and not for uh, fossil fuel. So there is really, um, uh, it's really hard to make sure there they are conditions in those budget that are put forward. Uh, and so it's clearly now that we have to, we, it's going to be decided now during those post decisions, we don't want to go back to an old normal. The old normal was a climate crisis, was um, um, a society and a system that was based on injustice. The old normal was us, uh, thousands of views in the streets. So we don't want to go back to that old normal. Going back to normal is is actually not that ideal. So we want to build this new normal. And we really hope Europe is going to take a lead on that to make sure that this new normal really happens, where we make inequalities are uh, at the lowest, that we make sure that the jobs that need to be, that are essential are valued, and that we switch uh, all the companies that we have to make sure they are all going towards a zero CO2 emission company. So we just think that for the moment, it's clearly now that we take the turn or we don't. But maybe you want to add something, Jada. Well, uh, yeah, please, Jada, please add to that. Yeah, no, I think, um, of course, Corona is a health crisis, but um, it cannot be seen as an excuse for inadequate climate policies. So um, we need to keep um, a momentum of climate um awareness going and put as much pressure as we possibly can because this climate dialogue cannot stop here because the consequences just keep going and it's getting worse and worse um if we don't do something so yeah maybe one additional question uh, interesting that you said Adelaide that we don't want to go back to normal which included also young people going on the streets a lot. So how do you envision the coming week, weeks, maybe months, to put pressure on, on the, the political level, whether it's at the national level or the European level? Yeah, clearly, we have to be very creative because we still want to respect the corona rules. It does not make sense today to call for a massive mobilization of thousands of youths in the streets. Uh, it would just not. It would just not be uh, intelligent, and that's not in our mind. But we still want to be present. We still want to. Uh, we still want our voices to be heard uh, on that level. And for that, we we have to be creative. We have to. We are coming with now actions that are, will be more physical than during the Corona lockdown. We were 
only able to do something that was through social social media, which is quite hard because I believe that you always you usually touch the same people. So if you want to be bigger, you have to be more um, maybe more physical and try to also get. I was really focused on Corona and like I told you with the ex example of the Amazon forest and the government saying the press is focusing on Corona so we can move on those that wouldn't be very climate friendly. Well, that that doesn't make sense. So we have to make sure that the press will talk again about this uh, climate crisis because we needed to put back at the center of political and public debates. So for that, we will do anything for it and probably actions that will just be a few of youth uh, and not massive mobilizations. Are you unmuted? Thank you very much. Of course, you can do as an action a kind of theater piece and pretending you're sitting in an airplane because then you can sit close together a bit a Belgian inside joke because we have a minister who wants to uh, yeah he advised the mayors to prohibit uh, manifestations while he allows people sitting next to each other in airplanes but maybe uh, Michael on this point what kind of actions do you see that your organization your members are doing or will do the coming weeks because indeed as being said I think we are now really in a crucial phase for some decisions Yes, uh, I think our member, especially our membership, is taking a lot of lead when it comes to uh, fighting to change the direction and when it comes especially to making sure that the recovery is built on a green uh, on a gr on a green way moving forward so that we don't go back to the normal which was until February. So for example, just to give some examples, uh, a number of our members, for example, started a new organization together with some other youth organizations, which for example is uh, Generation Climate Europe, which is also focusing on making sure that institutions take notice of climate change and make sure to tackle climate issues much more seriously. In our, from our perspective, as I was saying before, we are proposing always to have change. So when it comes to both the social and the economic inclusion, when it comes to human rights and participation, and when it comes to sustainability, words, our point is that it's not enough to go back. So, it's, so, of course, it's important to have the emergency uh, situation measures to make sure that people most vulnerable are helped and are not left to deal with stuff alone. But it's also important that in the long term, we are not content with going back to how things were before, but that we can make sure that we stop and think and see how that there is actually a long term change in the direction of how things are going. Uh, we would, our members, our members are on a national level, so the National Youth Councils and the International Youth NGOs, more on a European level, also are helping to speak to their governments and the institutions to make sure that we push for the systematic change. And we hope that the governments now do not use actually the health and economic situation as an excuse to actually go back on some commitments which we're already receiving. So I think now we are literally at a crossroads and we need to make sure that it is not used as, as an excuse to stop progressing and changing things, but now we need to use the pause which we had when it comes to the economy etc. to make sure that we rethink and then move forward, as I was saying before, with making sure that the economy progresses, but progresses in a way that puts at the center our the human, the us as humans and the planet, and make sure that everything as a recovery is built around that. Okay, many thanks. Uh, we are now receiving the first questions from the peeping, people following our webinar. And there's a first follow-up question for Özge. Uh, said that uh, young people want to work four days instead of five days. And so the question is then, will we get 20% poor or do we keep the salary? And keeping the salary, wouldn't this, this raise prices with 20%, which also makes us 20% poor? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, no, we really don't want to get any poorer than this, so we keep the salaries and we work less. Um, sorry about this. Okay. Um, 
also probably uh, Greens and together with the Green European Foundation, we made a lot of work on universal basic income. Uh, and uh, where, where we ask what is the value of life and what is the value that we bring to our societies when we work. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are quite interesting articles in the Jeff website. I'm also promoting Jeff here in the Green European Journal. Uh, for example, there was an idea about paying the universal uh, basic income from the European dividends. Uh, so there is the, the, the money is there and it is available. And either when we work for universal basic income or when we work four days and we give more opportunity for people to take uh, more work and also uh, to, to, to change the labor uh, and give more opportunities for people to be employed. Plus, when we work four days and we have three days holidays, then we will also have the opportunity to work for the causes that are valuable to us, like the climate or gardening or uh, taking care of your kids or taking care of the elderly, these things that actually create value for our society, but not considered economical value. So no, we keep our salaries, we work four days, and uh, we get richer uh, by, by, by this way, basically. I hope that was clear. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's, another, there's another question, I think, to everybody from the panel. It's about the leadership style. Uh, so the question is, do you agree that a more authoritarian leadership style has failed? And so we need a new form of globalism built on a kind of leadership focused on compassion led by young people so maybe who would like to take the floor if no one else will i, I can start Thanks. so I, I think uh especially when the crisis started developing we saw individual leaders also in uh, let's speak about europe so let's speak about europe even inside the eu we saw individual leaders, individual governments, which tried to, which took a very small approach to this. So they looked at, at a very short term approach. They looked at a very individualistic approach in their country. And I think we saw every country do whatever they wanted on their own. So every country forgot that they were connected, that they were working together, the, all the commitments which they were doing to have a closer union, et cetera. And everyone started doing their own measures to combat closing uh, borders on their own, the, the measures, the restrictions on their own, etc. I think, as we have seen, this has proved to not work. Uh, when we work together, the solutions are better. So I think that there was a failure that everyone tried to do their own thing without any coordination whatsoever. And in that sense, for sure, in my opinion, the leadership which was established, which was uh, exhibited there was not good, good, and I think we need to, as this has we have seen from the health pand the health crisis at least. Uh, when we work together, we can have better solutions. We can see that from a health perspective, same applies when it comes to uh, economic stuff. Same when it comes to the environment. So we need to make sure that we work together, and that together we come up with solutions which work for everyone, and that no one is left behind with these solutions and to make sure that as a community we take care of each other okay thanks who wants to add to this um, answer please do so okay i can, oh, I can add uh so on this issue, yes, indeed, the authoritarian governments are failing. When we look at the US, it's failing. Uh, UK is failing. Hungary, Poland, I mean, uh, the, the Turkey, where I am from, uh, this is a mess and this cannot go like this. We know what happened when this populist right wings got too loud and we are not going to let this happen again. Um, Naomi Klein said, <laughs> only a crisis produces a real change. And this change, this time we have to make sure it's the change, it's the progressive change that we want to see. And I, for one, welcome our young overlords. Okay. 
Adelaide, you want to uh, react or? Yes, I think a lot has been um, said and I mean, it's it's a bit hard uh, for us also as youth. It's the first time we went through maybe a crisis that was uh, this big where the world had to mobilize to to be efficient and to see it was a real test for all our leaders. Um, but it was especially a test also for us to see if we can face a, a crisis like that, because actually the climate is a crisis and it is going to hit us and it is already hitting people around the world. Um, how do how do we make sure they will also take this seriously uh, and they can handle it maybe better uh, than the Corona crisis, which is climate is going to be more on the long term but here it's it's really possible so um yeah so <laughs> i think here what we have learned from the corona was uh scientists and experts were everywhere on our tv show during the lockdowns uh, it was they were really put forward and then we were listening to them and if they said we had to put our, our mask on the mask on would be put but uh, for climate, this is missing, making sure that we put the expert at the center of the attention, at the center of all our uh, of all our media attention. And then we have also learned um, that we again, we revalue jobs. So that's something that we have to learn again for our politicians to make sure that we revalue those jobs that are, that, that actually have an influence in our in our in our society. Um, yeah, so that's really mean what I wanted to add. I had a third point that I just forgot, but maybe Jada can help me out. Yeah, so um, I think the Corona crisis really um, let the problems within the system. Um, well, pe people can see through this crisis the problems. What is wrong with the system? For the US, it's the healthcare system. Um, and for us, it is maybe how fast our government reacts to crises, um, as we all know, with the climate crisis. But um, we also can view this quarantine, the COVID crisis, as a wake-up call instead of this big drama. Of course, it is drama. People are dying. It is a health crisis. Um, this needs to be solved. End of discussion. But um, you see this as a wake up call and do better next time. Um, sit around the table, um, go in dialogue. Um, that's the most important thing. And just um, in increase your ambition. Yeah. And maybe if I can add one last. Of course. Uh, I just remind you. Um, I think during the Corona crisis, we've clearly seen that even though there was lack in Europe of coordination and everybody was quite individual it is a real problem, but where we're taken um, and, and those strong measures never ever in, in our life before we would have thought that this would could happen, that this measures would be taken because I mean, it, it brought us to a complete different <laughs> level and somewhere we never thought we would be. And so I think it's it's also something that we learn as youth that it is possible to take strong measures facing a crisis. And I really want to learn from this and I really want to make sure everybody reminds, like is reminded that it is possible if the citizens understand why we have to take those measures, that we take them and, and then that, that we can new life and what's amazing about climate is that we don't even have to stay home it's really about just creating a new a new normal a new life and so i am now inspired also by how we reacted by uh, facing the corona crisis to um, make sure we will also react facing the climate crisis okay thank you very much for your answer we are reaching almost the end of the webinar and I want to use the last minutes for maybe a more personal perspective. I think you all, you personally, your family, your friends were hit by the crisis. Uh, things have changed, maybe plans to go abroad for studying, traveling were canceled. And so 
And so from your personal perspective, I would like to uh, yeah, inform us how do you see the future and what you think is, is urgent uh, to give young people uh, a better perspective. So maybe uh, Özge, you can start. Uh, thanks. So um, I am not in the Erasmus age anymore, but maybe I can give a perspective of a migrant uh, because I am a migrant in Belgium. And with the COVID uh, crisis, when everything was shut down, it was very, uh, it is still an ongoing bureaucratic process. And it is, I, I can feel for a lot of people who are on short term visas and trapped in Europe. Uh, that uh, that are wondering what will happen to them and because they cannot leave EU right now. Uh, so I was in this uh, situation. So maybe I can reflect on that as a as a as a migrant uh, to stay in some place was quite uh, problematic for me during Corona time. So I feel a lot with with the people who are having similar problems. And then for a future, I think we know the answers. Uh, I think when everyone went into these lockdowns, we understand understood what is life and what is the value of a life. And at the Greens, we always say that there is more to life than just working. There is more to life uh, that we we all deserve a good life, um, regardless who you are. So I think this is something that we will work on, and I, I see hope there. And uh, I invite everyone to be part of this conversation for a, a, a better social, welcoming and feminist uh, European future for us. OK, thanks. Uh, Michael, your personal take on the Corona future. So, uh, firstly, Corona, how did Corona affect? So, because of my, so I'm from Malta, so I live on a small island of at the edge of Europe. Uh, and because of my role in the youth forum, usually that means I have to travel a lot. So uh, basically the option is unfortunately plain because we don't have trains to conduct mainland Europe and the, their ferry system is not really efficient with Italy. So uh, the difference between before and now personally was of course, I could see a difference of having to stay First of all, here at ho and as staying at home. And I reflected a lot in the past couple of months because I was staying at home and I'm fortunate to have a house which I live in with my family, which is not that small. And even me, my mom and our dog living in quite comfortably in a house with quite comfortable space felt the pressure of having to stay in a confined space. And what I was reflecting on is that I was feeling such pressure with staying in such confined space with still having relatively quite enough area. And I was imagining there are people, including young people all over Europe who are homeless, for example, and they couldn't have a place where to lock down, basically. I, I locked down at home. So I made, it made me reflect on other people, people who did not have actually a house to lock down in. People who in different areas of the world live in favelas, for example, where they do not actually have, it's not possible to keep the distancing from each other and stay, to stay uh, healthy and the drug etc. So my hope at least personally is that the experience of living confined in their single spaces makes young people and the population at large reflect on the difficulties faced by other people and how we need to then make sure to fight to change for a more equal world. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yada. Um, for me, um, how COVID um affected me personally. I am a student, so I am busy with my um, exams right now. And that de definitely took a toll on that. But also um, during COVID, I saw that even though the world is in a pause or however you call it, 
um, crises keep happening. For instance, Yemen right now um, has war, is suffering from famine with a cholera epidemic and um, COVID-19 on top of that. One Yemeni child dies every 10 minutes. So the world is suffering so many crises for um, every country, country each their own. But um, so a pause, there is no pause to crises. I would say um, COVID's cleared up a lot of problems, as I said um, before, um, what is wrong with the system. But I do have hope in um, what humanity is capable of because we conquered lots of things for instance the wars that have happened in the past so we can definitely um if we unite we can definitely conquer the corona crisis and uh, the cl climate change the climate crisis so um i think well i have hope in humanity if we act right now okay thank you very much so adela you have the final words. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I don't want to take it too long. I just want to make sure that Corona, that we that we don't we remember that Corona did not erase other crises. So it was a rough time, uh, rougher for others. But we want to make sure that we face the other crises that are present. Um, wherever they are, that we stay in solidarity. Solidarity shouldn't be only during COVID-19. It should be every day, making sure that we stand with everyone and with the people that need to, to that need help. Um, and I really maybe want to remind everyone that, for example, in China, the CO2 emissions were never as high as today. Um, and they were, so they were even lower before the COVID. So, COVID did not erase anything. Uh, we still have a huge amount of work in front of us. It's possible, but we really got to go for it. We got to chase it. And we still have to put our voices out there to make sure that happens and start acting now. <laughs> OK, many thanks for these closing words. Um, for the people watching us, if you appreciated this talk, you can make a donation so we can build on further talks you can find information in the chat and i also really want to invite you for next week which will be our last green post corner talk before summer and we thought it would be a very good topic to discuss then the future of tourism so i hope to see you all again next week and to the panelists many thanks for your contribution <laughs>